Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode one of Confessions of a Market Maker. I'm your host, Ray, aka All Day Ray, aka Poker Trader Ray. You can call me whatever you like, but don't call me whenever you like. And I'm joined here by our special guest. It's going to be reoccurring. It's going to be me and him. And this guy, he's been taking money, retail money, yours and mine, for the past 20 years. He's been known as the boogeyman of Wall Street, the gorilla of House Street. Some of you might know him as VWAP Trader on Twitter. Of course, I'm talking about JJ. JJ, thanks for joining me. How's it going, man? Oh, great, Ray. Thank you for having me. Of course, of course. And so uh, this is our first episode Um, everybody. Um, And, you know, the object, the objective, what we're trying to do is really, um, you know, educate everybody on who's on the opposite end of their trades, who's on the opposite end of the retail. And um, so that's where we got JJ on here. Um, JJ, so you want to, um, you know, explain a little bit about yourself? Okay. I I started out way back in the early 90s in 1993. Um, I, uh, read a book called Liar's Poker by Michael Lewis, who wrote, uh, The Big Short and the Blind Side. And, um, as soon as I read it, I was hooked. I knew I wanted to be a trader. I was living in Vancouver. So I applied to every brokerage firm in the city and immediately got rejection letters from every one of them. We used to call them PFO letters and, uh, please F off. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so, so what I did was, uh, I was working for the federal government at the time, and I was reading the Wall Street Journal one day at lunch, and a gentleman came up to me and um, started talking to me. He's like, you're a young kid. What are you reading this? I go, I want to be a trader. And uh, he gave me my first job. He was a stock promoter and uh, quite an interesting little guy. He looked like uh, a character off the Bullwinkle show. He was about five feet tall and uh, wore cowboy boots with a suit. He had a six-foot-tall blonde receptionist, uh, his assistant, and he drove a black Rolls. And uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you come across a, a, a lot of characters in that industry, huh? Oh, thousands. Uh, and uh, so he gave me my first job calling leads at night, uh, asking them uh, whether they wanted information on his mining property. And after doing that for about six months, he got me a job working at the company who produced the leads. And that's direct mail marketing for those folks who are, you know, uh, young. Uh, we used to print up and mail about a million pieces with corporate profiles to people. They'd send in information saying, you know, I'm interested. And then the brokers would get those leads and call them and try and close those people and get them to buy the stock. So um, working for that direct mail company and having promoters and public companies and little hedge funds and brokerage firms as my client base really, really helped me because when I did become a trader, I showed up to my first day on the trade desk and I had over 200 clients, but I didn't know how to trade. (laughs) Yeah. And that's the problem, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I was I was very fortunate. I had a, a female boss who was our uh, head trader, and she was an amazing, amazing trader. And uh, she taught me everything, and looked after me, and kept me away from the wolves. She uh, protected me like a mother lion, and uh, you know, very, very fortunate that uh, you know that's where I started. And what I did was my job was when. Um, Everybody comes in to buy a penny stock because it's been promoted by, you know, whatever means of promotion, which is now Facebook, Internet, whatever they use. Um, I'm the guy who has 200, 300 million shares of pretty much free stock, and I'm blasting that into the market as everybody else is buying it. And uh, that's why promoters, you know, would make 5, 10, 15, 20 million dollars every couple of weeks uh, because they'd be blasting hundreds of millions of shares of this stock into retail buying that they had generated. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> so, so today, JJ, um, I guess the, the topic that we're looking to focus on now um, is we're going to be speaking about the first 15 minutes of the open. Now from uh, what I gather, this is, uh, I would imagine it's the, the most volatile time period. Definitely. I mean, mm-hmm. you got to kind of think of the open as a garden hose. And um, all of the orders from the overnight, from the day, institutional retail, they're all sort of 
you know, lined up like horses in a gate right at that open. So that first 15 minutes, there's a lot of imbalances. There's buy orders, sell orders from all over the world and the market makers and the specialists on the floor of the exchange. And now with the alternative exchanges and things like that, they're trying to match up those orders. So there is a lot of back and forth and uh, what we call chop. Um, and it's very, very easy for you know new traders to get chopped up because a lot of people say it's you know it's a great time to trade and things like that. But I would I'd love to see their PLs, um, you know, mm. because that was the time that you know we really did take advantage of you guys. Um, you know, it was feeding feeding frenzies for us. Um, mm. you, know, for, you know, if uh, if if a stock gapped up on the open and everybody came running for it, we'd take it even higher before the open. Because market makers can, um, they can move a market pre-market without having to buy a lot of stock. But sometimes not even any at all. So we can move, you know, a market up three, four, five dollars a share, and um, then you guys come in and start buying it. We sell it to you at the high, and next thing you know, we pull the rug out. You guys panic, drop down the, we drop the price down or hammer it down, and buy it back from you um, all day. And um, that's what I call the gap and trap. And it's a very, very lucrative thing for us. Uh, it's why my boys would make four or five million dollars a month, um, you know. Uh, Sick. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. You know, because they, they would get the order flow from every brokerage from, you know, TD Ameritrade, E Trade, yeah. Schwab, all that order flow um, just goes to, you know, these market makers. And on penny stocks, there's, you know, there used to be 30, 40 market makers, but there were maybe four or five guys who had the call, and the call is the large institutional orders from, you know, the E-Trades and the Ameritrade. So they have all this retail buying coming in, and their job was to take the other side okay. and, uh, of that trade. Yeah. All right. All right. And um, so, so JJ, I just want to uh, just so, sort of backtrack just for one second um, for maybe some of like uh, our newer – uh, listeners, newer people to, um, you know, trading industry. Um, would you, how would you explain what a, uh, you know, a market maker is maybe just, just a brief rundown for somebody who might not even understand. Oh, that. sure. Um, a market maker is someone who provides liquidity. Uh, you enter an order to say buy a thousand shares of ABC stock at E-Trade. That order goes to a place in New Jersey, usually, or Staten Island in the old days, or you know downtown in the city in New York, and there'd be a firm that would pay E-Trade to get that order. So uh, they would take the other side of your trade. So you're buying a 1,000 shares of ABCD at a dollar. They'll sell it to you at a dollar if they have it. If they don't have it, what they're going to do is they're going to short it to you. They're going to sell it to you without actually owning it. And then they'll go back on the bid and try and buy it cheaper and make the spread. And that's how these guys make their money. They do hundreds and thousands of transactions every day. And, um, you know, they make the spread of, you know, in the old days, it used to be an eighth and then a sixteenth. And then it went to decimalization. So it was a penny. But still, it would have, you know, a, a penny here, a penny there. And you multiply that by hundreds of millions of shares. It adds up. Sure. Sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, um. Yeah, I know, you know, myself, JJ, man, I, I, I've i been burnt uh, the first 15 minutes easy. You know what I mean? Easily. Um, and I, I know a lot of other people do as well, you know, and I, I think the like the allure of, um, you know, the uh, the quick, the, the, the swings, you know, like the, the, the quick movements, you know, you're trying to chase those uh, big gains, you know what I mean? And, and I'm assuming that's why the market makers are attacking the first 15 minutes i mean so what i'm what i'm trying to ask is like why is the first 15 minutes like really targeted okay. by market it, makers okay well what it is is take a garden hose right and when you turn on a garden hose and you squish it in the middle it's going to stop the flow but then when you release it the flow is quite turbulent it's um you know the, in physics they call it turbulent and laminar flow uh turbulent is you know it's violent it's it's fast and that's what happens at the open there's a a huge number of orders that are coming in mm -hmm. and we're sitting there going, okay, like say for example, you're trading a thousand shares of Facebook. You want to buy Facebook. The news is good. The stock starts to gap up in the morning and you're like, oh great, I'm going to buy a thousand shares. So you go to buy a thousand shares and, you know, uh, for just example, you know, the stock's 167 and a half by 167.53, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you go to buy it and you can't, you know, it starts moving away. 
and it starts moving away, you know, higher and higher and higher. And there's a reason for that is because market makers need to fill your buy order, which means they need to sell that stock to you. If they, if E-Trade goes to them and says, you know, we have clients who want to buy um, Facebook and they say, well, we don't have any, well, they're just going to go to another market maker. So that's why we call it shorting to retail. You short the stock to your retail clients. And in order to make money doing this, you have to short at higher prices and buy back cheaper, right? Um, now we have a lot of machines and algorithms that perform that function, but the function is still the same. It's still a business. And, you know, the business, if you were selling low and buying back higher, you're going to be out of business in a day. Um, so our job was to move the market up. And you can move a market up before the bell rings by uh, showing, you know, you go to a level two screen and you start showing bids to the market makers. And if they don't have any orders there, they'll just start moving away. And then you can move the stock three, four bucks really easily. Um, I used to do it all the time. And you don't even have to buy a share. Um, a lot of people don't know this. Um, so, you know, you, you'd go and you'd move a market up, then you'd open it and then you'd drive it even higher. Right. So you'd have a couple of market makers and they'd work together and they'd boost the price of the stock up in the open. And then as the great Jim Dalton says, um, the stock market is an auction. So when people see price going up higher and higher, they get whipped up by the price. It's very emotional for them. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. um, and that's what we rely on. You know, we, we just sit there and just, they just come to us, you know, and they're just foaming at the mouth to buy. And we used to have a saying, you know, when the ducks are quacking, feed them. So, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. you know, you guys would come for it and we're like, yeah, sure. Here's a hundred thousand. You want a hundred thousand more? <laughs> you know, we just keep selling. And, um, and nine, nine times out of 10, uh, if it's not, you know, a, uh, a trend day in that stock, um, that order flow or that buying pressure is going to ease up. It's like waves in an ocean. You know, the, the first one or two waves are going to be stronger. And then the ones after that will be less and less and less. So as less buying comes in, um, you know, we get a nice short position, um, you know, and, you know, say, you know, the stock was opening it, you were thinking of buying at 167 and we drive it up to 175 or 176 and we're short couple of hundred thousand shares up there or even millions sometimes um then all we do is we pull the bids um we bid the stock up we support it so we can sell it to you at higher prices a lot of people don't know this and mm -hmm. um so when that buying pressure stops we're like oh okay because we see all the orders so uh oh you know the the, the buying's running out let's uh let's pull the rug on these guys now so yeah. then what we do is then we start hammering the bids and then, you know, you'll, you'll see things like a million shares on the offer on the level two, and that will scare the living daylights out of retail traders because they don't know how to re read a level two or even know what it is. And, um, you know, they'll be seeing that, oh my God, all this stock's coming at them and it's not, it's, it, they're fake orders or spoofing as they call it now. And, you know, we'll drive the price down and then we'll, you know, we'll hit a few bids and, you know, if some buyers come in, we'll wipe them out really fast and scare. And, and then we just cause a panic, you know, and in that first 15 minutes and then everybody just runs for the exits. And then we just, sit, you know, and we'll just sit and bid and wait and buy it all back cheaper. You know, yeah, and, yeah, just, yeah, just playing off of uh, the, the human emotion, like for yeah. sure. And, yeah. um, yeah, love it. And so, so JJ, um, from my understanding, uh, a lot of the stocks that are targeted, you know, that we're seeing these big swings on are, are the low float in the the penny stocks, correct? Oh, oh God, yeah. They're, uh, and, you know, I, and I have to say, I was, I, I was the, uh, you know, I was the guy who chopped people's heads off. You know, um, it, I was the guy who controlled the supply for the stock promoters. Mm -hmm. And those low float penny stocks, they're a low float for a reason, because when we take a company public, there's a shell company and all the stock is held by the stock promoters or a group of promoters. So there's really no stock available to buy uh, until we start pumping that stock into the system. When you guys start buying, we're like, oh, great. You know, once again, the ducks are quacking. Let's start feeding them, you know? Yeah. Uh, and uh, the low float thing, I mean, you'll see a lot of these people in the last couple of days, uh, weeks, actually, um, you know, our friend Steve and, and D, they've, they've said, hey, can you help, 
you know, look at this person, they bought this stock and I'll, I'll look and the stock will have a million shares in the float, which means a million shares available to publicly trade. And then I'll go and read the SEC filings and I'll see that they've done an, uh, an offering registration statement for 400 million shares at, you know, like 30 cents and the stock will be trading at five bucks. So there's 400 million shares that, you know, guys like my clients have at 30 cents. That's hitting a $5 market, you know? Yeah. And everybody thinks, oh, it's low float. It's great. And then you'll see like a stock with a million shares trade 70 million shares of stock in a day. And, um, you know, and I always say, look, if there was a million shares in the float and you put 70 million shares of buying into that thing, the stock shouldn't be five bucks. The stock stock should be $5,000 a share, right? Just based on supply and demand, right? But that's not the way it works because there is cheap paper hitting these markets every day. And people don't know that. When you're buying stock at 10 bucks, I'm selling you stock that my clients got at 30 cents and, um, right. you know, they just have no clue. Right, right. Yeah, no, it, it's, uh, you know, it, it's real fascinating uh, to me, you know, um, me being, you know, newer to yeah. trading to this whole industry. Um, and, and I think I, I didn't even give a background on myself. I'm, I'm a professional poker player. Um, who's, you know, looking to learn it. And that's why even doing this podcast is, a, you know, a great learning experience uh, for me or what I'm using it for. And, um, and, and it always fascinates me, JJ, like these, um, you know, how much, uh, you know, just talking to you um, as a late, like learning all these things that, you know, the general public just has no idea about. Like, like you guys are literally, it's like, like I, I use the analogy, like you guys are just printing money. The market makers are literally printing money. Oh, yeah. You, I mean, with the mistakes that retail is making. I, I definitely. I mean, if you look at Citadel Securities and Ken Griffin, who owns that place, uh, he's one of the largest market makers in the world. And uh, I think he owns maybe a billion dollars worth of real estate. And that's like three like three apartments, one in New York, one in London, and one in Miami, like 200 million bucks a piece. That must be so, nice. <laughs> you know, if people say market makers don't make money, you know, like my guys, and they were junior level guys, were making four or five million dollars a month. Um, and they were all under 30, um, you know, so it, it, it's just crazy. People get involved in this business and, you know, and I don't like to sound um, egotistical, but, you know, it's like you're, you're trying to do brain surgery, but you haven't taken basic anatomy. They, have, they don't even take the time to figure out the mechanics of what happens when you buy a stock. Yeah. Um, and if you, if you actually understood that and you understood a little bit about you know, how the market is an auction and how to control your emotions, you know, you might have a, a bit of a better shot. That and also, I, I highly advise everybody to trade a real market and stay away from, from penny stocks and low float stuff. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, um, you know, um, a, another thing, JJ, I wanted to ask about the first 15 minutes um, and the movement of the stocks. Now, um, a lot of times, is it is it one person who's uh, doing the manipulation? Is it a team of people? Um, elaborate a little bit on that. Well, in the old days, um, in the New York Stock Exchange, you'd have one specialist. Um, in my trading room, we have one guy who was at Spear Leeds and Kellogg for 30 years. And in the old days, say you were trading, you know, you wanted to buy General Motors or General Electric, there'd be one guy who made the market it on the floor. In the NASDAQ, it's different. You have, you know, uh, in the old days, 30 to 50, you know, market makers per stock, and they'd be competing for that order flow, right? So what the market maker does is if I have a market making firm, I'll go to a place like E-Trade and I'll go, listen, I'll pay you, you know, X million dollars or whatever for all your orders, right? So what clients don't realize is they're paying commission to E-Trade. E-Trade is selling their orders to a market maker like Citadel. The client's getting it on both ends, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the retail trader, you're getting had at both ends. You're paying commission. That's why, why do they think you can trade for $4 or, you know, uh, a trade or five bucks a trade? Um, because they're selling your order flow and, and that's what the model and that there's nothing wrong with that. As long as people understand that is the mechanics of, of the market that has been set up in the United States. And, mm -hmm. you know, it is a very efficient market and it is liquid and, um, Otherwise, there'd be extremely no price stability at all. If we didn't have guys making markets, it, it, it would be like the Wild West. You know, it'd be 30 cents bid, $3 offered. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Right, right, right. We you know? Yeah, so yeah. Um, 
Yeah. So no, I, uh, you know, very um, insightful, right? So so we got all this knowledge now, JJ. We we understand a little bit better what the market makers um, are doing, what they're thinking. So now, me as a retail trader, right, and, and everyone else who's listening, what's what's our strategy now that we got this knowledge? What what do we what are we thinking? How are we approaching the first fifteen minutes? Well, I, you know, first of all, if you are trading retail and you're a new trader, um, you want to look at what you're trading. Um, people will come out and say, "Oh, this stock's going, that stock's going," and if you can trade it successfully in a day time frame. Go ahead and try, right? But I would let the first 15 minutes, sometimes even the first half hour sort itself out if you were a new trader because you're basically literally walking in to traffic on a freeway um, and you have no idea what's coming at you. So sometimes the best thing to do, and Jesse Livermore, one of the greatest traders who ever lived, said all the big money is made in the waiting. And if you can wait and be disciplined and watch price action, and do that for a while before you start, you know, jumping in. Uh, the other thing is try, you know, if, if you're a day trading and you're a new day trader, you're going to need $25,000 in an account to go back and forth during the day to, you know, satisfy the pattern day trading rule. I would say younger traders should start out on the micro e mini where there is no pattern day trading rule and the commissions are, you know, as low as 78 cents, you know, round trip. Um, and it's a stable market. It's a futures market, which is based on the S&P 500. So it's regulated. It's thick, which means, you know, you can get in and out. And if you have a bad day on a micro, on the micro, you'll lose $50, $100, right? As opposed, you know, to losing $1,000, $1,500 on a stock play. And, um, and learn how to trade well before you think about starting to make money. Mm -hmm. uh, because trading well is one of the hardest things I've done. And and listen, I'm, I'm a guy, I've manipulated stocks from $0.30 cents to $300 a share using two cell phones off a subway platform in New York City. So, <laughs> um, And that's not even having quotes in front of me. And so I, I know what I'm doing. I'm a mechanic. I can, you know, I, I know the system. I, I can hide a short position for a year. Um, but when I started retail trading, I just, I got blown away. Because I didn't have a trade plan, I wasn't disciplined. I had no idea. I thought, you know, I know what I'm doing. I got 20 years. I can, I can do this. Yeah. And um, all it took for me was to lose like $250, and you know, I'm cheap. So I'm like, wait a second. <laughs> yeah, and then you know, 250 setting you off. Like, come on, JJ. I know. Oh no, 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 man. I'm cheap. You know, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm cheap. I, I, I am really cheap. You know, I might have not, not, not the gorilla oh, house street. Come on. Man. Oh God. Oh yeah. No, 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 no. We, um, you know, <laughs> no, no, no. I just, uh, I was like, wait a minute, 300 bucks. Uh, you know, I was like, wait a second. I need to learn something here. So I went and I found the boys at Shadow Trader and, and, um, and Jim Dalton. And, you know, I, and I can't say any, you know, enough good things about them because they took the blindfold off and they introduced me to market profile and uh, auction market theory and Jim Dalton. And it changed my life and it dropped my blood pressure 40 points easily. Huh. Excellent. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, watch, watch out for the health. That's very important. So yeah, no, because you're, you're, you're already getting into it, JJ. And that, and that was a question I, I was going to have um, was um, your uh, market making, you know, quote unquote experience versus the retail trading experience and how they differ, how strategies differed. And then obviously retail trading is uh, probably more difficult, I'm assuming. Retail trading is the hardest thing I've ever done. Um, you know, I'm, you're talking to a guy who could make, you know, I, I was you know, like 50, fifty, a hundred thousand dollars a day without breathing hard, uh, while you're eating pizza and telling, you know, jokes and playing practical jokes on other traders. It's, you know, it, it can be stressful, but you know, it was the most amount of money I've ever made in my life while having the best time. Retail trading is completely different. You're on your own. You're sitting in a room in front of screens. Uh, you have no idea what the order flow really is like. Um, you know, people say they can read order flow and all of that stuff and, and good for them. But, you know, I, I need, uh, you know, I'm an older guy. I need the market profile to visually lay out the order flow for me so I can, 
you know, I can figure out what's going on in a market and who's in it. You know, like I like to say, who's who in the zoo. Um, and uh, every profile tells a, a different story. So that's why I, I really rely on that. And retail trading, um, yeah, it's institutional is completely different. Working out hundreds of millions of shares of stock in, into retail buying, that's a completely different type of trading. Um, and it's it's so much easier because all you're doing is picking up, every time you pick up the phone, you make 10 grand. You know, because um, mm-hmm. Citadel will call me and say, you know, the stock's uh, a, a dollar bid. Can I show you a bid for half a million shares? And I sell it, you know, half a million shares at 98 cents. The market maker makes two cents for showing me the bid on that trade. I charge three and a half to 5% commission on that trade. Um, you know, and, um, you know, that's a good trade. You do, you know, you do a bunch of those every day. Um, you know, you're making really, really good money. Um but you're you're just destroying retail traders because they're just coming for this stuff and and it's um, I, you know I, I had a massive heart attack in 2012 and then I worked for a company and I did some teaching and when I when I started hearing retail traders and what they went through because I never had met them before they were just nameless faceless bids uh, that I would sell stock to I had no idea then you meet people and oh I lost five hundred thousand dollars and I lost this and I lost this and my you know it's like oh my god I got to do something to help these people you know yeah <laughs> it's yeah, just sure. uh, you know I, I I couldn't do it anymore you know yeah yeah well uh you know we're we're very grateful JJ that uh you're you're shedding some light on this um so I guess so to recap a little bit of, of what we've been talking about is that one retail trading is is very difficult very difficult um we're probably going to have to, you know, if you're a newer trader, sit out the first 15 minutes, watch it, take it easy, be patient. Like you were saying, um, you let the trades come to yourself. Am I, uh, have I summarized it pretty well? Yeah, you hit the nail right on the head. Let the trade come to you and it's going to take some time to realize when a trade is coming to you. So watch price action because all the really great traders, they know when to trade, when to sit on their hands. Um, you know, I've got a buddy of mine uh, in our trading room. We call him Odds because he is kind of odd. Uh, but he is one of the most patient structural traders I've ever met. You know, he'll sit there and, you know, people will be jumping in, jumping out, getting chopped up in, in bad price action. And he'll just sit there for an hour or two. And then, you know, the the market will start showing. The profile will start showing us and 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 telling us a story every profile has a story and it'll tell us who's trapped who's trapped long who's trapped short what kind of players in the market you know next thing you know he's short and he'll hold that short or that long position for an hour two hours and you know he has 20 30 handle days you know on size Mm -hmm. um and and he's calm when he does it. You know, he's not, oh, I, I'm short, I'm long, you know, because, we'll, you know, I, I, I've got guys in the room and off the bell, you know, 10 seconds into the open, they're like, I'm short. I'm like, it hasn't even opened yet. What are you doing? You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah. It's, you it's know, just action already. You can't wait, you know? You know? You got to get your fix. <laughs> you know? And, and that's okay. There, there are guys who can do that, like, Packs on uh, on Twitter. Now that guy was on the floor of the Chicago Mercantile, and that guy has order flow running through his veins. So in the first ten, you know, ten seconds, he knows what's going on. Mm-hmm. We don't. <laughs> right, right. You know, like I, I, I'm not that good. Right, right, right. So, there, so there's, so <laughs> there's, there's a very select few that, yeah. from your experience that are going to be able to trade the first, you know, the the open yeah. well. Yeah, the, and, and those- yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, and, and there are some times when it's okay to trade the open, like on a trend day. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, when you go with a gap, um, you know, and the strength, you know, the the market breath will be ten to one positive, and the delta is fifty thousand, and you know, you're going, so you just get on board and just ride it, right? And that's okay. But a lot of times, what I see is a market will open up, you know, in range of yesterday. And it'll be choppy because when a market is choppy, what it's doing is it's waiting for information, right? Mm-hmm. You, you want to just for, – for new people, you want to you just, just briefly say what like choppy, what you mean by choppy? Oh, uh, choppy is what um, – another thing I call it a, is a pickpocket market. It's a market that moves up and down and up and down and up and down in a very tight range. Um, you know, And it's doing that because 
um, the large traders are sitting out waiting for big inf- for some sort of information, and we let you know the retail and the um, you know the the larger pools of money get in there and fight out the open and fight with the order flow, right? And so a lot of people, you know, they'll short it, then the market will go up, then they'll cover, and then the market will go down, you know, and then they'll buy it, and the market keeps going down, and they're like, oh my god, what is going on? Um, and they just, and we call that getting chopped up. And I, I call that a pickpocket market because it's just guys like me going, Oh, you know, he's buying at 10. Great. I'll sell it to him at 10. Oh, we take the price down to eight. Oh, now he's selling it back to us. We just made two bucks, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and we just pick your pocket for that first half an hour. And, uh, you know, that first half an hour pays for the, for, you know, um, their jet cards, <laughs> You know, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. You know, it, it's or the or for their Hampton summer rental. You know, yeah. Um, so it's just if you're a new trader, you know, there's I know there are a lot of people out there going. You know, you pay me two hundred bucks a month, I'll treat you know teach you how to trade the open. Um, you know, maybe they can, but I I haven't heard any successful stories about a new trader trading the open successfully and consistently. Right, right, right. Um, you know, because consistency in retail trading is tough, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, it, it's really it, that that is the hardest thing I have found, and I've only been re- trading retail two years, um, so I'm kind of on the journey with everybody else. Um, I'm just trying to help people because, you know, uh, my my job was uh, I was the you know director of dirty tricks. Um, and so I'm trying to apply that oh, to what's going on now. That's uh okay. Ne- next, next episode, I got a new AKA for you. The D- director of dirty tricks. <laughs> All right. I'm writing that one down. All right. Another, another alias for JJ. All right. Hey, so, um, so JJ, so we, um, you mentioned patience, right. As being, uh, you know, a key attribute to being a successful trader. What other attributes from your experience have you met in people that are, uh, you know, successful traders? Uh, discipline. Um, discipline to do the homework, uh, to go through the, you know, their charts or whatever their preparation process that night, um, have a, a clear idea of where they're going to execute if the market does this or this or this, um, have scenarios mapped out, and then they have the actual um skill to execute. Um, because when I started, I can sometimes call a market to the tick. I'll go, it's going here, it's going here, you know, inventory's long and and I'll know exactly what's going, but pulling the trigger and executing well and managing that trade, mm-hmm. um, those are skills that I, I'm still learning. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, so I find um, discipline, um, discipline to execute, to have a trade plan and execute on your plan when you see those opportunities come up. And the other thing is, you know, to sit on your hands when you see those opportunities not there. Um, you know, so there's there's a lot of that and risk management um, because there are a lot of smart older guys say, our job is not to make money every day. Our job is to make sure that we're there tomorrow. Um, right. mm-hmm. You know, and there's a lot of times in these markets where it's, it's really, really smart to keep your gunpowder dry. Yeah, yeah, sure. No, no, I, I think um, that you would know that, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I could, I could, uh, of course, relate. Like, like you, um, being there the next day, like, um, you know, be, like playing poker, being a professional poker player, like that's. Um, I've always had a little bit more of a conservative, um, approach, and uh, yeah, I guess that's a great motto. Like, I want always wanted to make sure you know I had money to be in the game. Uh, if I take too many risks, I'm out. I'm not, I'm going to McDonald's, you know, like, oh, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, and, and you're lucky if you go to McDonald's, if you get wiped out, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. It's, you know, and I didn't get that, uh, say that's, I, I stole that from Pax. Uh, <laughs> I've got to give credit where credit's due because mm-hmm. he's, uh, you know, he, that, that's his line, but it's, it's true. Um, you know, I, I've seen so many people blow up accounts because they just cannot stop pulling the trigger. Yeah. You know? Yeah, no, no, for sure. Uh, I think that's, you know, and I think we could even just do a whole episode just on that topic. And I'm sure that, you know, will be something we'll get more into. Um, and so, you know, wh- while we're kind of talking about that, um, I, you know, I just have a couple more questions for you. Then I think we'll wrap sure. it up. Um, you know, 
we talked a lot about the, you know, the first 15 minutes. I kind of just, you know, a few questions um, about yourself. Um, you know, you mentioned, you know, we've been talking about, um, you know, attributes uh, that make successful traders, um, making sure you're there the next day. And so something that came to my mind is like, I know, I know throughout your career, right? You, I'm sure you've hit some like down, you know, down, I don't know how you want to call them, down swings, oh, down yeah. weeks, down months. And oh, um, yeah. How did you deal with that and how did you get the resiliency to bounce back? Because, you know, I'm sure a lot of new people are listening, have wiped out their accounts, have had, you know, are losing traders. You know, what, what where, where did you find, the, you know, the resiliency to come back? Uh, that, that's really a good question because I have, you know, I have, you know, I've been through the spanking machine a few times. Um, you know, uh, 1997 with the long term capital thing. Um, 9-11 was horrific. Um, you know, before 9-11, I had a penthouse and two Porsches. Afterwards, I was living above an Irish bar and taking the bus to work. Um, you know, so it's, you, <laughs> yeah. know you, you know, it, it happens that way. Um, I've had partners, um, you know, take seven, eight figures from me. So I, I've had, um, I've had a lot of that in my life. Luckily, I've had mentors. Um you know, there are guys who have been my clients um, who are, you know, they're billionaires and, you know, they've been through the same thing. So they were the ones who, you know, they'd pull me aside and go, hey, look, um, you know, you got to get back on the horse, you know, and I'd be like, oh, man, you know, this, you know, I got really kicked in the head really good here. You know, I had once a, a client of mine stiff me for $700,000 um, in one day. We were doing a short squeeze and um, he pulled um, – about $8 million out of the prime broker, um, manufacturers trust. Thank you very much. And, uh, <laughs> you know, so they, they, uh, you know, we, we were doing a short squeeze on a stock and we had the stock at 25 bucks and within, Oh, half an hour to 45 minutes, that stock went from $25 down to two. And, um, the bank that was clearing the trades in what we call a prime brokerage account, um, took all the sells and stuck us with the buys. So I was, I was, you know, I was out 700 grand in, you know, oh, maybe three hours. And, um, you know, that was the first big hit I ever took. And so that was, that was tough. Um, you know, and, uh, luckily I had some really good clients that, you know, they just kept feeding me order flow so I could, uh, make good commissions. And I paid that off in about eight months. Um, and, uh, so it's, it really comes from within. You have to really, um, it helps if you have a good stable home life. Um, you know, if, if you, if you have someone special mm-hmm. in your life that can support you, not financially, but emotionally, um, you know, retail trading is really, really hard. I haven't had any big drawdowns as a retail trader because I've only been doing it two years. And also because my risk management is crazy because I'm incredibly, incredibly, paranoid because I've been through so many uh, market changing experiences, you know, where like, for example, a brokerage firm will shut down and people's, you know, accounts are locked up and they'll be selling out and Mm -hmm. uh, you'll be holding a stock at $5 and the next thing you know, it's 20 cents. Um, So I have a lot of scars. Yeah. You're humble. You, You mean that humble, that humble pie. Well, you know, it's it's like I say, it's my my favorite saying, and I got it from Marv on Wall Street. We are only one trade away from humility. Yeah, um, you absolutely. know, and, and that is so true. You know, yeah, yeah, no, because I I think you know, you know, now, me, I'm not obviously I'm not experienced in trading, but you know, there's so many similarities between, uh, you know, poker and trading, and, and just being that both ventures. You know, it, it, the risk, you know, there's it's a risk adverse, you know, venture. And um, I think both new people in both fields you see come almost um, more often than not like guns blazing. It, you know what I mean? Like, oh, yeah. And you can tell that these people haven't, you know, been through the ringer. They're not experienced because you'll find your experienced people are the ones who are more conservative um, are, are humble, you know, they just carry themselves differently because they've been through those downswings and they know like what the market could do to them, you know, what, what, you know, the cards at the table could do to them and that they're always, you know, vigilant. And so I always find that interesting. You could see the difference between people who are experienced and who aren't. And I'm sure you've, you know, witnessed the oh, same. 
Very, very much so. I mean, you look at a guy like Steve Cohen, um, you know, who used to run SAC Capital and has uh, his own fund now, you know, hedge fund, one of the best traders out there. Nobody even knew what he looked like in the 90s. Um, you know, Business Week ran a, uh, a profile on him and they had to use a uh, hand-drawn picture because nobody had ever photographed him. Huh. Um, you know, and, you know, that... <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that guy, I mean, that guy could trade a million shares around you. You wouldn't even know it, you know? Um, so yes, a lot of the really big traders that I have met are some of the most humble people you'll ever meet. And, uh, and, you know, these guys, you know, they're, they're moving, you know, positions that are like the GDP of small countries. And, <laughs> you, know, yeah, wow. you know, and, and they're just some of the nicest people you'll ever meet. And, um, uh, you, and yeah, then you could always tell the new guys are like, oh yeah, trading's easy. You know, it's like, oh, okay. You yeah. Well, no, no idea. No idea. No, I, I just, man, it, it's crazy. And I'm sure it's crazy to some of the listeners too, JJ. Like, you know, you talk about these things. So like. You know, you know, because that's what you did. You did this stuff for 20 years. You're like, oh, I lost 700K, you know, took me eight months, nine months to pay it back. But like for someone to like, you know, people listening to to like, that's not fathomable, you know, like it's nuts. Like the, the, these stories and it's, you know, it's real interesting. You know, the funny thing is, and, and the truth of the matter is now I say it 25 years later, like it was nothing. The mm-hmm. day that that happened, I thought my heart was going to stop. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, I remember what happened. The owner of the firm was literally standing on my desk screaming at me because my partner had let the client trade um, in the account way over his credit limit, you know, uh-huh. and um, and I was stick with the flu. I came in and, you know, we had this huge, massive problem and I was like $700,000, you know, because just literally three months ago, I was making 2500 a month. Uh, and, uh, mm-hmm. so I remember standing outside the brokerage firm and the compliance offer who officer, who's the, um, the, the sort of the policeman of the brokerage firm and, you know, the bad guy who has to tell brokers to sell out their accounts and stuff. He, uh, he just kept feeding me cigarettes and I smoked an entire pack of cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, I'm sure. And I don't even smoke. I was just so stressed out. You know? <laughs> yeah, don't even smoke. Smoking a pack, yeah. You know? And I was like, I was, and my world ended. And you know, I, I had a, you know, I had a girlfriend at the time, and I, and I went home, and I said, oh my god, I think, uh, I think I'm done. Uh, I just, you know, I just got taken for seven hundred thousand yeah. dollars, and uh, by a guy who looks like Walter Matthau too. And uh, that's <laughs> even the worst part of it. And um, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, man. I mean, the, the, just, you know, I, I, I couldn't imagine, man. Like, uh, you know, I, I've dealt with losses, but not nearly to that magnitude. Um, and yeah, man, I think it just speaks to to your character, to your your, res- your resiliency. You know what I mean? Like, and I think that's a good lesson for anybody who's listening. You know what I mean? Like, you're going to take, you're going, like, coming into the market, just expecting like, hey, you're going to lose, you're going to go through some downswings and like, just preparing yourself for it. I think will you know, not that it'll make it easy, but it'll probably lessen the blow some, you know, th- that's the thing. And, and, and always remember that, you know, the, one of the first guys, you know, the guy who gave me my first job, you know, I used to call him uncle Barry. Um, he's since gone from this planet, but he used to always say, JJ opportunities like a bus. There's always another one coming, but you can't get on the next one. If you're stuck under the wheels of the last one. Hmm. You know, and, Mm -hmm. uh, and I really thank him for that, you know, and, um, and the other major thing to my second boss told me when it came to penny stocks, my first day was, you know, Hey boss, you know, which one of these deals should we buy? Cause we had, you know, 200 public companies that were our clients (laughs) and, um, (laughs) (laughs) and he looked at me and he, and he was smoking a cigarette and he put down the cigarette and he goes, JJ, you don't buy stock, you sell stock. Paper's 15 cents a pound, you know, always remember that. And, mm-hmm. and really that, that, that's what, that's the thing of penny stocks, you know, to make money in penny stocks, take a company public, take 200 million shares, run it up to three, four bucks and sell it. Yeah. That's how you make money. You right. don't make money trading penny stocks. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And um, yeah, almost wrapping up here, JJ, I just have um, 
Uh, another question for you, maybe a question or two. Um, taking it back to when you first got into the industry, right? From from you know talking to you, you know, off the podcast, I know you um, were a bouncer first, correct? Before, <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, yeah, yes, okay. I was in, then, in my early days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How uh, uh, any uh, interesting uh, experiences from that, and how you know. Did that, if you know, at all help with trading in any capacity? Definitely, uh, definitely, because uh, I, I worked in the in a nightclub in uh, Vancouver, and uh, it, you know, Vancouver in the '90s was a, um, you know, it it was crazy. Um, you know, it's a Pacific Rim city, so we had all sorts of gangsters. Uh, you know, uh, the gentlemen who ride motorcycles. You know, uh, the gentleman from Asia. We had gangsters from all over the place, gentlemen <laughs> from Russia. And when I became a trader, I realized that I a lot of these guys were in the market. <laughs> I did. Yeah, so a lot you know, of so, yeah, I'm learning new stuff. I, I didn't know. Oh, that yeah. You, you'd Vancouver. be surprised. Oh, wow. Uh, oh, you, you know, because the market's it's a liquid money machine, and it's a great way to move money from point A to point B. And these yeah. gentlemen did so. And I really tried to avoid, um, you know, having them as clients, even though they knew me, you know, Hey, you're the kid from the bar, you know, you're a trader now, you know, uh, let's open an account. And I'm like, ah, <laughs> you know, I'm like, well, you know, if you, if you guys ever need a favor, just call me. And, you know, so I, I had all these guys that I did favors for, um, I had, luckily I don't owe any of them favors. Yeah. yeah um, thank God. It, yeah. It's, it's better to have them owe you a favor. Yeah. Um, you know, um, you know, I, I once uh, helped uh, the gentleman on motorcycles liberate, you know, a couple of million dollars out of a Swiss bank, um, okay. you know, things like that. So <laughs> that's where, you know, being a bouncer really, <laughs> really helped. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sure. 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 And you, uh, you, you mentioned, so, so once, once you got on the trading desk from, from what I recall, you said earlier um, that like you, you were thrown on there with like no experience. Um, yes. of, of trading at all now um how did you you know how was the learning curve um how quickly did you pick it up or how long did you pick it up like you know uh you know um it, talking it, about it it took a little while the execution but the thing is i had spent a couple of years trying to get into the market and at the time i was single and i had no life so i did nothing but obsessively study i i would talk to traders, uh, the guys who used to come into the nightclub are a lot of the guys who got me my first jobs, um, you know, in, in, on desks and things like that. Um, so I would talk to traders, I would read books, uh, you know, the internet wasn't around there uh, back then. So I'd have to buy these trading books and they were from Wiley finance and they were like $200 for a book and you'd have to order it in. Yeah. Um, but when I got to the trade desk, the one good thing was out of those 200 clients, a lot of those guys had owned brokerage firms in the States. They were stock promoters. A lot of the guys came off the Stratton Oakmont floor from the Wolf of Wall Street. Um, those kind of characters. And they taught me a lot of the business. Um, I wasn't a great trader at first, but they said, listen, kid, we can trust you and we can trust you not to front run our orders and short our deals. So, you know, we'll teach you how to trade. Just don't screw us. Or we'll come and kill you. But, um, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But uh, are, we, are you still in Vancouver? Are these some of the gangsters? Are we talking? No, 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 no. I am. I am out of Vancouver now. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. Yeah. No. Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. So, yeah, um, but, uh, you know, I was very lucky because I had clients who had owned brokerage firms, and I had a lot of clients that you know were worth a hundred, two hundred, three, four hundred million dollars, and even some billionaires. Um, and they went with me because they could trust me. Um. And, um, you know, on my business card, it used to say my secrets die, you know, your secrets die with me. And, um, you know, my first client was a Swiss bank. So okay. uh, I, I, I learned, I learned a lot. It was trial by fire, but I loved every minute of it. So uh -huh. it wasn't really like, I was just, I was like a sponge soaking it all up. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that's what it, that's what it sounds like. You just really immerse yourself, um, into it. And, and I think, yeah, I think people out there listening can, um, you know, take that in really. And I think that's really anyone who becomes successful 
like in their fields, you know, you even mentioned, you said you had a, uh, you had no life at first. Well, that probably helped you because you was just focused a hundred percent on trading, on getting better. And, and I think, yeah, like whether it's trading, whether it's poker, whether whatever it is in life you want to do, you really just got to immerse yourself into it. And if maybe that's putting other things on the back burner for the moment, you know, it's, I guess, you know, a sacrifice, sacrifice you got to make. Um, yeah, but, it, it, definitely. Yeah. All right. Well, well uh, huh. Yeah, it's it, the thing to me though. It never seemed like a sacrifice because I loved every minute of it. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so yeah, JJ. I mean, I think that will you know. I think we'll wrap it up there. I mean, anything, anything else you got to add? No, no. I'm just really, really grateful for this opportunity, and I uh, would like to stay. Uh, you know, say a thank you to uh, Steve and for um, you know finding me and and talking to me and, and putting this all together and thanking you for uh, you know uh, working with me on this it's it's really exciting um, I'm really looking forward to um, you know helping new traders out and you know try and kind of be a little bit of a sherpa and guide them and you know keep them out of the mouth of the shark um, <laughs> you yeah. know mm-hmm. and, Absolutely. Uh, you know that's that that's pretty much it and um, you know, and uh, I guess, you know, in a closing statement, I, I, there's somebody I'd, I'd like to thank and uh, who's really inspired me and, and, and really been, you know, quite instrumental. And I'll just say this in French, uh, France Antoinette, uh, vous êtes mon étoile, mon ange, and uh, she'll know what that means. So. <laughs> All right. All right. Excellent. Well, yeah, JJ, um, yeah, appreciate you. I, I had fun doing this. Um, looking forward to doing more. Um, you know, we're planning on doing this like you know weekly ish basis. Um, and uh, yeah, JJ, we appreciate you. Um, you know, shedding some light on uh, the other side of the trading industry that you know I think most people don't know about. Most people, you know, the knowledge is not really out there. Um, and so we appreciate you uh, doing that. And um, yeah, I had fun. Looking forward to the next one. And uh, yeah. Too. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity. All right. All right, JJ. All right. Have a good one. Speak to you later. You too. All right. Have a good one. All right.